Hey everyone, today I'm talking about 3D printing, and I guess I want to start the video with discussing this machine. And if you don't recognize it, that makes perfect sense, because this thing was built before the conception of my channel as a whole. And I'm going to let you in on a little bit of a secret. If you compare the quality of the redstone and how old it is, you're going to notice that as things get older, they tend to get worse. That means that you're essentially looking at the guts of quite possibly the worst redstone machine that I've ever designed, compiling every single mistake I could have possibly made in existence. But luckily it works. And if I told you that this project has a special place in my heart, I'd be completely lying, because I hate it with every ounce of my soul. However though, that's just an opportunity, which is why today's video is going to be about fixing it because I'm going to be taking about every single ounce of knowledge I've gained in the past nine months and putting it to the test, designing this absolute behemoth, along with the help of a bunch of people who are probably a lot smarter than me. But before we get into the details, let's start from the very beginning, and that's data storage. Because we can build this entire 3D printer, but without a way of telling it exactly what to print, we're not going to be able to make anything. So the way we'll do that is we'll store many, many barrels filled with each with a bunch of shulker boxes that'll each contain all of the items that will store our data. As of right now, one shulker box gives us enough data storage to store exactly one strip. And the way we do that is just with concrete colors representing the colors and sticks representing air, which are currently represented in sand and that'll come in super important later. But unfortunately, we need a lot more. Scaling things up to the barrel I showed earlier, what we get is 27 of these shoulder boxes, which is 27, 27 long strips. That's a 27 by 27 sheet of the piece, or a slice of the entire print. If we go ahead and scale that up again, we're going to need 27 of these individual barrels to create the full 27 by 27 by 27 cube of printing information that we'll need to print our item. Overall, when you compare it to the giant 27 by 27 cubes we have down there, our data storage is pretty small. We've just got a 27 block long string of barrels, each containing 27 shulker boxes, all of them containing their own little pieces of information that will constitute tiny little strips of the entire whole build. Now, accessing this data gets a little bit more complicated, but in short, each of these barrels essentially has the ability to be called, which sends the shulker box in there to this box unloader. And what that does is it takes the box and pulls out each and every single item in order, runs it through this nice sorting system, and each of these is going to trigger their own colored slice and send the signal to the filament section to send the particular color directly to the next stage of the printer. Now at first, it might seem like a pretty interesting decision to fling these colors through the air. I mean, surely this isn't just for show. And the reality is that this really kind of interesting design serves an incredibly important practical purpose, and that's retaining the order of our colors. In order to see what I mean, let's look at a slightly less successful approach to this problem. You see, one way we could get all of these sand pieces to fall into a central location is just simply stacking all the filament dispensers on top of each other. But the problem immediately becomes apparent when I try to use a color like white, then a color like pink, and then a color like gray. The reality is that no matter what order we dispense these in, the pink is going to take a lot longer to fall down to the bottom, meaning it's possible our white and gray could arrive first, leading to an order screw up. When we wanted the pink to be between these two, it actually ended up on top. And that's because it takes variable amounts of time for our filament pieces to get to the end location. However, if we instead choose to put every single filament dispenser on the same Y level and simply just use slime blocks to fling them all to the right location, we can ensure that it takes the same amount of time for each piece of sand to fall to the desired location. As you can see, each piece of sand has even spacing no matter which dispenser it comes from or how far it has to travel in order to get there. Although it's undoubtable that there are definitely a bunch of other, slightly less contrived solutions to this problem, I really did want to take a page out of the super fast Ender Pearl Cannon Handbook and fling the sand through the air to make sure it all arrives at the same location in just the way I wanted. Now, after the colors are sort of sent in from above, they all get funneled into this really long strip maker, which essentially just makes these strips that will eventually formulate the walls, that will eventually formulate the whole print. 
Okay, so now that we understand how to turn data into color, I want to address one of the most fundamental problems of almost any kind of 3D printing that exists both in Minecraft and in the real world. And that's the unfortunate need for supports. We live in a world of gravity, and that means that placing things on floating surfaces is a little bit more difficult than placing stuff on stuff that's already there. Luckily though, I have the perfect solution, and part of that is actually actual cleverness, and the other part is the fact that we're in Minecraft and 99% of our blocks actually don't even have to worry about gravity. Now, this is the super cool part where the sand comes in. Because the thing is, is that all of our blocks we're using are concrete powder, except sand. And sand has one unique property. It's, well, not concrete powder. That means that it doesn't cure into solid concrete, which means that when we actually wash all of it, it's the sand that's going to remain as a gravity block. And when we put it to the test by forcing it to float for a brief moment, we'll see that it'll do exactly that. It'll just fall straight down, whereas the concrete blocks remain perfectly in the air exactly where we need them to be. What this essentially means is that, although we had to use gravity to create this entire slice, because since we are stacking things on top of each other, we no longer have to obey the rules when we convert everything to concrete and punch out all the air blocks. But this strategy actually creates a new problem, because the reality is, is that once we've gone ahead and switch cheese our entire thing, it's now really difficult to move this thing. We can't move it as one whole layer, because it's just going to sort of squash together into the air spots we just created. What that means now is that we actually have to move this entire wall forward to a very specific distance without it interacting with any other walls. Otherwise, they'll just simply smosh together and nothing's going to work. In technical terms, what we essentially need is exactly what this machine is. It's a giant piston wall that will move exactly as far as we tell it to. Except I didn't design this because I'm really bad at slimestone. When I tried for about 30 minutes and got essentially nowhere, I decided to go ahead and contact some of my fellow members of WaveTech, and I went ahead to Mythical Pingu. If you don't know who that is, they're essentially a super genius when it comes to anything slimestone, and they were a massive help, because the thing is, is I contacted them at literally 1am in the morning, and 4 hours later, they come up with this insane machine, and then go ahead and apologize for delays? I don't know how their brain works. Anyways, point is, go check out what they do, because their skill is just unmatched when it comes to slimestone. I also want to take this time to formally mention that I'm officially a provisional member of the WaveTech SMP, or CMP, because I mainly do creative work, simply because a few people have gotten a little bit angry at me for just casually mentioning it without never actually publicizing the fact that I'm there. They're an absolutely incredible tech server with a bunch of really cool people. If you want to learn more, check out the Discord in the description. Anyways, on with the rest of the video. Now we're basically almost ready to start actually printing. We've got the filament ejector, we've got the giant base plate that actually moves our sheets around, and we've got our data. But wait, where did this data actually come from? Because this is a bunch of really complicated shulker boxes that totals to about almost 20,000 items that there's no way I'm placing by hand. And then this is where JKM comes in, another fellow member from WaveTech, and he essentially just makes a program that converts any schematic of any build that is made with concrete colors and converts it directly to that string of barrels that I can put directly into my machine and have it print that exact same structure. Oh, and he also sent me a cone. What an odd object that bears absolutely no significance whatsoever. But before we get into the actual cone shenanigans that are about to ensue, I just wanted to show a tiny bit of taste of what this thing actually looks like running since we've kind of not really even looked at the whole thing together. As you can see, all the sand gets piled down and it slowly builds up these layers. And while this runs, I guess I want to quickly briefly plug, if you're liking the video so far and you want to see more stuff like it, make sure to subscribe, check out my other videos, and you'll probably see a lot more stuff like this. Anyways, I've gone ahead and actually just skip to the section where it's going to load a full layer. It's actually going to push all the way this across, start uh, purifying all the sand, but it also sticks out this layer of pistons right here, because while this whole situation runs down here, we actually don't have to slow down the process up here. We can keep constructing this line and building it on top of these pistons to drop down whenever this section is ready. 
And after that returns a little bit, this flying machine right here is going to take off, pushing this entire thing forward, lagging out my game a ton. And that is going to fly all the way to the end, probably clash into these blocks that I've placed down here. And drop off the blocks. Then it's going to send the signal right to make the flying machine back. And here we can actually see that this buffer line is actually filling up a little bit as this machine returns. And once it does, it's going to drop this line and continue the process as if nothing happened. What we eventually end up with is the first layer that we've printed all the way here on the far end, and it's completely deprived of all of the air blocks that we removed given by this giant sand column tower. Anyways, now that we're out of the testing phase and everything seems to be working, let's actually print something real. I took JKM's cone file, pasted it in, set it ready to print, and watched in horror as it outputted this thing. And I just want to mention that this thing didn't just pop out. It took about five minutes for this abomination to just be slowly printed out, while me and my friends just completely lost it as it slowly formed into a face, into a disfigured mess, into having a halo, and just completely, almost entirely ruined the cone while still vaguely retaining the cone shape. So, I want to go over the first few things that went through my head. First off, number one, I saw the face. It was pretty funny. Number two, I thought about how this could have happened, and I thought about how it's either my machine that's broken or JKM's, and I really wanted to believe that it was JKM's code that was broken. Foreshadowing, this was not the case. His code was fine. Because I just couldn't even fathom how something like this could be produced. I also briefly considered the possibility that this was some elaborate prank by JKM, because it's essentially impossible for me to verify whether or not the ROM drive he sent me was actually generated by a functionally looking cone, because I can't just like read the shulker boxes, that's for a machine. So this could have just been an elaborate scheme to make me think my machine was totally busted. By the way, also, here's a comparison to the actual cone that JKM should have sent me, and as you can see, it was not a prank. It really is that messed up. But when I hopped into a call with a bunch of other people and actually took a second to analyze the errors, there actually is a real pattern, and a real explanation for why everything happened. The first thing we should have noticed is that the entire fifth layer was directly lifted to the top. And this isn't some sort of message from the heavens. This suggests that one of the shulker boxes essentially got stuck in stasis for the entire time until it was literally forced to be loaded into the machine when there were no others left. Another detail we should recognize is that it's completely symmetrical. It retains all the symmetry of the original cone, which suggests that there was no tampering in the individual strips, only in how the Y level of each of these strips was organized. And the last super important detail to notice about this incredible failure is the side. Because if you look at this, the first thing you might think is random. And what creates random? Droppers. Which means something fired too many times, and that means that shulker boxes ended up in the same dropper together, causing it to be randomized. So now we know what to look for, let's solve these problems. What actually turned out to be the problem is this little circuit here, which preloads the entire loader with three boxes to start off, but it fails to account that it tries to preload itself using the circuit it uses for the rest of the system putting boxes in, which means it just flooded the entire system initially, randomized a bunch of orders, and totally screwed up the Y levels of every single strip that was inputted. Another important detail that led me to this discovery that I forgot to mention was the fact that the base layers remained entirely intact, which suggests that the preloading mechanism worked perfectly, but everything that happened after that was likely a result of the randomness that the excessive preloading that we caused was causing. After completely removing the extra preloading circuit that was from a previous era of the design, I went ahead and printed it again, only I just moved everything over so that it could immediately start with the cone part, and not just the massive amount of air that JKM decided to provide with me for the first, like, eight layers. And it printed perfectly. This was the output. Anyways, here's just a nice time lapse of me printing out this weird rainbow cake that JKM found on the internet. And I want to mention a couple things. Number one, the filament system on this thing is kind of busted right now. It eats more filament than it really should, and also it just has a bunch of other problems. 
It could also be improved by installing a sand recovery unit that actually takes the sand that is produced from each layer and recycles it to be used in the next one. This would basically eliminate the need to have such a tall sand filament pile. I also wanted to mention that I believe my printer is slightly better than Il Mango's printer because I'm not sure how much speed it actually beats it by or if it's even slower, but the fact that it doesn't have any sand support remaining after the prints is a massive win for me. Anyways, that'll basically be it for today's video. If you want to check out my Discord server, see announcements, see teasers, or just have a chat with me, I'm usually there. Make sure to check that, it's in the description. If you're enjoying the video, make sure to like and subscribe, check out my other content, and I'll see you next time.